He's not fooling anyone anymore. I think all these little girls grew up to, to strong women that really rocked his world. I want answers and I want accountability and these people need to step up. Vulnerable children victimized by a trusted doctor turned monster, sometimes with their parents in the same room. Children not listened to in a system that seemed more interested in award-winning results, all at the expense of young women and girls, abused by the teen doctor for years. In the wake of such evil, the system turned a blind eye and betrayed them all. Devastation, including suicides, have followed. Hundreds of lives ruined. Parents, sons, daughters, families now struggle to put the pieces back together and context explores the healing needed next. I'm Lorna Duick. And I'm Sheldon Neal. And I'm Molly Thomas. And this is Context. Canada has not been left unscathed in this. Gymnastics Canada has lost its past Olympic coach to sexual charges. Gymnastics Canada Chair Richard Crepin will explain new policies and procedures now put in place to protect young girls and women. Psychologist John Amici says people underestimate the almost supernatural position of sport in our society. He says it's become like church. Well, it's a reality check time from the former NBA player on disgraced so-called super doctor Larry Nasser. And one woman's story whose abuse by a coach started at age 10 in the home he was a regular trusted visitor in. And former Rutgers University gymnast Holly Murray gives five thoughts from a gymnast on the abuse scandal. She's here to tell her story of healing even in one of the most wicked of life's experiences. Well, to our Molly Thomas now with a look at what happened and how incredibly devastating this ordeal is for so many. But I'd like to add that some of the following may be sensitive to younger ears, so viewer discretion is advised. You saw the Unbridled fury from a father unleashed on this man. Grant me five minutes in a locked room with this <laughs> demon. Well, I'm going to have to get the on. The father, Randall Margraves' three daughters, were molested while under the care of disgraced, so-called gymnastic super doctor, Larry Nasser. You convinced my parents that you didn't stick your fingers in my adolescent vagina. But I knew when it was time to use my first tampon, not to worry, because my hymen wasn't intact. You used my body for six years for your own sexual gr gratification. That is unforgivable. USA Gymnastics has come under fire with allegations that many women reported the abuse but were not listened to, even by their own parents. You convinced my parents that I was a liar. The Olympic team has now hired a law firm to investigate when it first heard of Nasser's abuse and where it dropped the ball. Michigan State University is also under investigation by the Attorney General and the NCAA. That's little solace to an infuriated father and to so many other parents. I believe in God Almighty. I believe in heaven and hell. And I can only hope when the day comes that Larry Nasser has ended his days on this earth, that he will be escorted to one of the deepest, darkest, hottest pits in hell there is for him and people like him. It's difficult to fathom forgiving Nasser, but for many parents, forgiving themselves may be even more difficult. Many of their own children were abused by Nasser, even while they were in the same room. The betrayal we feel is sometimes very hard to grasp. Our daughter is scarred forever. Our son is scarred forever. <laughs> and we as parents are scarred forever. Lindsay's dad, her brother and I will never be the same. We trust no one. While brave survivors step up to speak, some can no longer express their sorrow of being abused and not being believed. Donna Markham's daughter was one of them. She took her own life. 
because she couldn't deal with pain anymore. It'll be 10 years in March that I lost my baby. She was 23 years old, and every day I miss her, every day. And it all started with him. It all started with him. The judge sentenced Nasser to 175 years in prison for sexually abusing more than 250 young girls and women. The number pales in comparison to the hundreds of lives now destroyed by one man. But these women and girls will go on. The heinous acts of one man will never erase the accomplishments of gymnasts and female athletes like Simone Biles, Brittany Rogers, Mary Lou Retton. For context, I'm Molly Thomas in Toronto. Molly, um, you grew up in sports. All of us as parents are just sick about this story. Tell us the ground change this story brings about between child athlete and coach. I mean, it's hard because, uh, you know, I played competitive sports all the way through elementary, middle school, and all the way up to the college basketball level. And I will tell you, Lorna, your, your coach is like your best friend, especially when you get to those high levels of, of competition. And your physiotherapist and your trainers, they're who you spend the majority of your day with. And so trust has to be embedded there. And I do think that there's, there's one part of it with, with these people that you have just an unbridled access when it comes to your lives and their lives because you spend so much time together. And so maybe that needs to be reevaluated. But I will say, when coaches do it right, when they do it right, it's the most positive foundational influence. Some of these people have, have made me who I am today in many ways because they did their jobs right. But when you do it wrong, when it comes to an abuse of power, this is what we see in, in the lives that it can destroy uh, in the wake of it. So yes, it's disheartening. It's super hard to watch as a, as a female that competed, for sure. Right. You've got a powerful interview coming up. We'll mm -hmm. stay tuned for that. But now on to Gymnastics Canada. We are reeling that Gymnastics Canada has suspended its former Olympic coach. The chair of Gymnastics Canada, Richard Crepin, is here with us now. Mr. Crepin, let's start with the bad news. Let's begin with your head coach, Dave Brubaker, former head coach of Canada's women's gymnastic team. He's been placed on administrative leave and suspended as a member coach from Gymnastics Canada due to harassment charges. How does this affect our program? The support that was given to the athlete was given immediately after the suspension of Mr. Brubaker. So the Canadian Olympic Association, they, they do have um, a system like an employee assistant program. So we did put all our national team uh, gymnasts and coaches in contact uh, with uh, that, that system. Well, now to the allegations against coach Scott McFarlane. 2013, there's some very unfortunate news coming from this. Charges that uh, he sexually harassed a 10-year-old girl. We can't help but put this all against this backdrop of the horrific Nasser case. Is there something about the culture in gymnastics that is at risk? Now, in the case of Mr. McFarlane, he was fired from a gym in 2013. The information didn't, wait, didn't went up. So the last thing that Gymnastic Ontario heard was in October of 2017. At that time, Gymnastic Ontario took a decision to suspend him for three months. They informed Gymnastic Canada and we followed the lead of Gymnastic Ontario. And Mr. McFarlane uh, did something during his suspension that prompted uh, the parents to go to see the police and charges were brought up. Uh, what is Gymnastics Canada doing to ensure the safety of the children that participate in this beautiful sport? It is a beautiful sport. It is one of the most beautiful sport in the world. Uh, right now, Gymnastics Canada is working closely with all its provincial partners uh, to ensure that we have alignment, to ensure that we all have one way of doing things. So we are doing background check. We always been doing background check. As you know, background check only works if the person has been charged. We also uh, looking at our policy, our safe sport policy, our code of conduct policy to ensure that they're aligned from Gymnastic Canada to the province. And one of the things that we also doing with coaching association and their certification of coaches is the rule of two. So they are always now to have two people, not one male with a female uh, 
uh, gymnast. And that's traveling, that's in the gym, in hotels, no matter where you are, it's always the rule of two, and we enforce the rule of two. Richard, thank you for taking the time with us today. That was Gymnastics Canada Chair Richard Crepin. Coming soon to Context. When it comes to marijuana, Canada's youth are considered the highest users in the developed world. Let's Talk Marijuana is a youth forum that will gather in Victoria, British Columbia to talk all things pop. Well, let's do what context does best. Let's look for some Christian hope into this tragic story. We go now to Molly Thomas. Well, all the medals, podiums, and adoring fans will never replace the pain and destruction felt by the American gymnastics community right now. Now, as a former gymnast herself, a varsity gymnast, our next guest, Holly Murray, is very close to this story. She's been writing about the allegations since they surfaced in 2015. Holly, you know, you have a personal view into this tragedy. How are your teammates, how are your friends coping? It's been really impactful. The gymnastics community is a tight-knit community. Um, I personally was never in contact with Larry Nasser, but I have teammates um, who were impacted by him or other forms of abuse within the sport of gymnastics. Um, and the reality is everyone handles grief and suffering um, differently. You know, extensively about how sexual abuse and justice really collide in this case. Uh, what do you exactly mean by that? This is not just um, a small abuse problem. I think Larry Nasser um, and his sentencing is evidence to a greater problem within sports culture. Um, sports and the desire to win, the desire to get medals um, can lend itself, especially in a sport that has young athletes peaking at a very young age while they are still minors. It enables a culture that can create an environment for abuse. Um, and ultimately, that's a justice issue. It's a child welfare issue. I think as a Christian community and as a Christ follower myself, I'm called to stand up um, in the name of justice because God himself is perfectly just. Um, and I know that this whole story angers him and hurts him deeply. And so as a Christ follower, it should anger me and hurt me as well. What does that justice mean, though? I think that's the big question for so many people, right? Is it is it hundreds of years in prison? Like, what is that justice? I think his sentencing of 175 years in prison is a start to that justice. Um, I think also it is a matter of looking to the organizations and the sports governing bodies that created an environment where this predator could thrive. Unfortunately, if Larry Nasser was able to do what he did for so long, there are likely other predators um, either in the sport of gymnastics or other sports, abuse and assault athletes. Um, and so justice will be served in the sense of seeing change in these organizations, um, demanding safe sport policies, um, and also even at a smaller local level as a parent or a club coach, um, holding coaches and trainers and doctors to a higher standard um, and really looking out for the welfare of an athlete before the welfare of an organization. Holly, I want to play a, a clip for our viewers at home of one brave woman who is choosing to forgive Larry Nasser. Let's take a listen. You spoke of praying for forgiveness, but Larry, if you have read the Bible you carry, you know forgiveness does not come from doing good things, as if good deeds can erase what you have done. It comes from repentance, which requires facing and acknowledging the truth about what you have done in all of its utter depravity and horror without mitigation, without excuse, without acting as if good deeds can erase what you have seen in this courtroom today. The Bible you carry says it is better for a millstone to be thrown around your neck and you thrown into a lake than for you to make even one child stumble. And you have damaged hundreds. The Bible you speak carries a final judgment where all of God's wrath and its eternal terror is poured out on men like you. Should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you have done, the guilt will be crushing. And that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet. Because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found. And it will be there for you. I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt so that you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me, though I extend that to you as well.
Wow. That was Rachel Den Holanda, really the catalyst, uh, the first survivor to come forward against Larry Nasser. What did you think, Holly, as you listen to those words, as you hear the word forgive? Yeah, that is so, so powerful. Honestly, she extended uh, forgiveness when I was wrestling with how do I forgive Larry Nasser and these organizations for the abuse that um, had occurred. And so she was the voice that I needed to hear. Um, I also really appreciate that, that although she is extending God's grace and forgiveness to her abuser, she's also demanding that justice be served to the fullest extent under the law. Mm. And I think you can't make sense of forgiveness or God's grace without understanding his wrath and his just nature as well. Forgiveness does not release Larry Nasser from the consequences of his actions. It does not release accountability from USAG or Michigan State or any of these other sports governing bodies that enabled him. Um, but there is freedom that can be found in forgiveness. Um, and I think for her, as she's been working and um, mulling through this process for quite some time, um, this is a big step in the healing process for her. Um, and I think it's a big step in the healing process for a lot of victims who are able to sit there and know that they are now safe, that he is behind bars, mm -hmm. and that the right people are being held accountable. Holly, I want to ask about one thing that you wrote to survivors in your blog post. You said, God's love did not waver the day someone took advantage of you. Now, many people mm -hmm. that read that, they do not believe that. So what would you say? What would you say to yeah. people that have been abused and hurt by someone and are wondering what that means? I think the first response to that would be that our relationship with God is not dependent upon how we feel. And so he is there for us, even when we don't acknowledge it or don't know that he is there. And the reality is someone who is a victim of sexual abuse um, or ongoing sexual abuse and trauma, they feel very alone. And God does not say that they should feel that way. He doesn't say that they shouldn't feel angry or that they shouldn't be hurt. And people are on a different process of healing. And in those early phases, there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of grief. And there is comfort in knowing that we have a God that sympathizes with us perfectly because he feels that too. Holly, thank you so much for uh, your time with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That was Holly Murray. She is a former Rutgers gymnast. She is now the athletic campus minister at the University of Wisconsin. I want answers and I want accountability and these people need to step up. The last few weeks of sport in the headlines have been peppered with scandal, which leaves many asking, what do solutions look like when it comes to ensuring safety in sport? Well, retired NBA player turned psychologist John Amici joins me now. Uh, John, let's jump uh, right into this. Uh, you say that organizations have purposeful amnesia. Is this in reference to how the NCAA handled uh, the Nassar uh, situation? It's, I don't think it's just the NCAA. I think it's an institutional problem, and the NCAA is certainly that. But so are the individual uh, schools themselves, their institutions. So what I mean by purposeful amnesia is the idea that when it suits them, they overlook things in one context that would otherwise, in, in society, peak instant interest. They overlook you know, some of, the, some of the allegations in the NASA case, which really don't bear repeating, but there are elements of, of barehanded pelvic inspections and stuff like this that in any other medical context, in any other educational context, would immediately blow a whistle in and of itself on its own. It would be a cause for review at the very least and probably major sanction. But somehow, in the context of, of uh, a successful program, a number of successful programs, including the, the USA program, these items managed to be missed over, skipped over, and at times purposefully demeaned. So that's, that's what that purposeful amnesia is. It's the idea that the institutional well-being takes priority over the individual well-being. Uh, you've also said, and, and quite strongly, that people underestimate the almost supernatural, is the quote, position uh, of sport in society, referring to it as a church, if you will. Can you unpack that for us and, and, and unpack uh, what that looks like through the lens of participants and their parents? Yeah, so it, it's absolutely, uh, we, we give a, a, 
an unnatural gravitas to sport. We believe that it is a thing of good um, always. We think that that participation in and of itself, coaching, will teach these amazing and vivid life lessons that give people an advantage. And because we have that perspective about it, we allow um, the, the sport, whatever it is, to undergo less scrutiny than we would normally put it under. I mean, think about this. With our, with our young people, with our kids, we often have a real interest in who's teaching them in the school. We want to make sure, do they have the requisite qualifications? Have they passed through a, a number of different trials to get there? Have they got a past record in other areas? We want to know this stuff if, if someone's teaching our child French. But somehow when it's teaching them gymnastics or basketball or something else, a past record isn't even asked about. And behaviors that we might really question if it was in a classroom, because it's on a mat, because it's in a court, because it's on a field, we let them go. Hmm. So we give it this kind of gravitas, this, 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 this status, this enhanced status that means that we, we are a little less vigilant in and around sport. And I want to make sure I get this question because I feel like when, as news agencies, when we cover these things and we cover bad story after bad and never ask, so how do we get a, uh, overcome this? What's the next steps? We do a great injustice. So what needs to change so that these horrific stories and more like it don't continue to arise? I know you've touched things on institutional problems or reform needs to happen. We've even gone as far to say we need to redefine what sports actually represents in society. Uh, what's our first step? Yeah, I mean, I, I think redefining what sport stands for in society is a little bit difficult. I, I, uh, I don't think that's probably going to be the first step. But I do think that it, if we look at sport and attach and try and remove some of the mythology around it and treat it as if it was any other educational environment that we were thrusting a young person into and simply said, what are the levels of diligence that I would go to for any other entity that wasn't sport and do that? Hmm. So most parents, when picking out a school, they make lots of proactive choices. They look around, they want to know, does the school have this uh, thing or that, this qualification, this activity? And they really are meticulous. Many parents are um, perhaps overly involved in that they're in there trying to understand what does this mean for my child? Whereas with sports, we often have a, a drop them and leave them perspective. We drop them off, whether it's that four o'clock swimming practice in the morning, or whether it's the after school thing where we're picking them up. And, and we ask them, oh, was that fun? And that's about it. Hmm. We, don't, we don't really say, you know, who is the assistant coach of this organization? You're going on this trip to somewhere two hours away. Who's going to be taking care of that? And then we trust sport simply because we believe we've been told it's, big, it's good for our kids, full stop. John, can I throw this? I have about 10 seconds to do this very quickly. Uh, so what about the child psychology element in this? Do we have to switch the way we coach? I I'm a gentleman who played uh, Bantam Boys, uh, a really like, <laughs> basketball for the city of Ottawa. And yeah, it's very intense where they yell, but it pushes you forward. So do, does change happen on the coaching level or wh what happens there? Yeah, I mean, there is nothing that can be achieved with, with discursive violence, with yelling, with shouting, whatever else, that can't be achieved some other way. Most people who yell in sports, they're not yelling for the young person, for the participant. They're yelling because that's how they feel best expressing themselves. Interesting. It's not that I want to soften the sport. It's simply think about what is best for the young people. John Amici, thank you so much for uh, really sharing those insights with us. Thank you. That was John Amechi, retired NBA basketball player, now psychologist. He joined me from London. He's not fooling anyone anymore. I think all these little girls grew up to, to strong women that really rocked his world. Coming soon to Context. When it comes to marijuana, Canada's youth are considered the highest users in the developed world. Let's Talk Marijuana is a youth forum that will gather in Victoria, British Columbia to talk all things pot. On this sourable subject of sexual assault in sport, let's close with a note of hope. Alana Antoniak, you were 10 years old when your brother's hockey coach started to sexually abuse you. What impact did that have in your life, Alana? Uh, it nearly destroyed my life, to be honest. Um, I, through my t teen years, I had stuffed it. I stuffed it. I buried it. It had happened. I blamed myself for it. I thought, well, if I didn't, you know, the coach was talking to all of the other kids. And um, 
and I blamed myself for it. And it wasn't until I got help that I realized my behaviors, uh, how it impacted my life, commitment issues, um, promiscuity, uh, feeling like if just a genuinely nice man takes you on a date for dinner, uh, being sexually abused, I thought that I would have to owe him something for that. Um, never thought I had a right to say no. Uh, yeah, I was damaged. I was, uh, I was damaged. Trust issues. And you tackled, I must heal from this sexual assault. Where did you find healing? How did you do it? I found healing um, through the Lord, through Jesus, was my healing. Uh, I was uh, a recovering alcoholic. I have six years sobriety on March 8th of this year, my father's birthday. And uh, it didn't work out, it wasn't planned that way, but it ended up that way. And it was when I came, went into treatment and I was going through therapy that the sexual abuse, I was 32 years old when it came back up again. Uh, I will mention that I had mentioned it to my mom when I was 15 years old and she didn't believe me. So I buried it, I stuffed it because I thought, well, if my parents don't believe me, then who's going to believe me? So forget about it. I'll just ignore it and stuff it. And it was when I went into treatment, it had come out. It just the, the surface came out. When I was nine months sober, uh, I, I truly believe with all of my heart that the Lord uh, allowed me to have nightmares. And um, I relived it all through my nightmares. Uh, did I go crazy? Absolutely. I went, I, I went, I went crazy. Uh, and the reality there, came that it wasn't my fault. And was there a spiritual exchange that could happen then? God brings up the nightmares. If, I, if he didn't bring up the pain, my experience with the Lord is if I don't go through the pain and I don't go through the process, I, I can't heal completely. I have to feel it. I have to go through it. I have to reach out to Christians. Did you have to forgive? I had to forgive. I can't move on unless I forget. And has God put a love for yourself back mm -hmm. in your life? He has, he has, he has completely. I have my struggles, don't get me wrong, it comes up, uh, but it doesn't last. It doesn't, it doesn't control me. My past does not control me anymore. It doesn't define who I am today. Ilana, thank you for closing us with hope that there is a new day and a new mm -hmm. beginning mm -hmm. for victims of sexual assault. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Quite a difficult show, and uh, there's more on the website, and if you also need healing, and uh, let's get out there and check out what's on the website for healing, but let's get out there and protect our kids in all their arenas. Thanks for joining us. See us again next week.